All right, so um, welcome everyone. And I'm going to, um, so welcome everyone to the Volunteer Tutor and Classroom Aid webinar series. Uh, we have Roberta Hatcher today. And just a reminder that this um, webinar series happens on the second Tuesday of every month at 9.30. Um, in January, we are going to have a session by uh, Chelsea DeLeo, and she's going to be talking about um, contextualized instruction. All right. So, Roberta, you can go ahead and begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everyone. As Rachel said, I'm Roberta Hatcher. I'm the training coordinator at Literacy Pittsburgh. And I'm delighted to see so many uh, tutors I recognize from Literacy Pittsburgh. Um, and welcome to the rest of you. Um, so my role uh, as a tutor or as a training coordinator is to train the volunteer tutors. Um, and I also teach an advanced, um, an advanced uh, citizenship class. And so um, this training is actually informed by a number of threads. Um, first of all, by research into adult language learning, um, but also several threads of my own experience, um, both as a foreign language learner, including experience in an advanced conversation course that I myself failed. Um, I'll talk more about that later. And then over 25 years of teaching language, including advanced uh, conversation. And, um, and then also talking with some of our tutors who work with intermediate and advanced English language learners and drawing on some of their joys and frustrations. Um, so I will be including some activities and strategies that you can immediately use in your teaching, but I'm also going to step back um, just a little bit and consider conversation in the context of language learning. So before we start, um, I would like to learn a little bit about who all is here. So this is a large group. So I will just ask you to put in the chat, um, don't worry about your name, we can see your name, but just what and where you teach. So uh, what level do you teach small group or one-on-one? -on -one? and do you teach in person or virtually? If you could throw all that in the chat um, and we'll get a look. Okay, in person, one who hasn't started yet. Okay, uh, other people working programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of one on one, um, some in person, some virtually, small group advanced class. Great. Um, okay, so we have a very nice range. Um, advanced. Okay, very good. Um, I'm going to invite you at the end of this talk to actually share some of your own strategies and resources that you have found successful in your own teaching because we have a lot of good experience in the group. Um, so to talk about conversation um, and teaching conversation, I'm going to start with a quote by Samuel Johnson who said, we had talk enough, but no conversation, okay? So often I think when we think about teaching ESL conversation, we think primarily about speaking. Um, and so you can encounter a list of topics, a list of conversation starters, a list of prompts, all designed to get us uh, learners speaking, but as if somehow then the speaking will take care of itself. Um, so I would like to lean a little bit on the definition of conversation as 
an oral exchange, okay? An exchange of sentiments, observations, opinions, or ideas. And so actually conversation draws on a whole constellation of skills, okay? Not just speaking, but also listening. It is an exchange. And you also need all the support skills of vocabulary, pronunciation, grammar. And I would also like to include here cultural norms and culture not only being in terms of content like cultural references, but also norms of what is appropriate conversational topics, what is not, um, and a lot of the unspoken in a conversation, how to read some of those unspoken cues. All of that is part of conversation. Okay, so this is what I plan on talking about today is first about those conversation starters, when they can be useful and what are some of their limits. Um, but then also, what is the goal in teaching conversation? And then I'm gonna talk about how students often reach a, at, at a certain level, they often reach a plateau. And so how do we move them off of that plateau? And what does it mean to improve your conversational skills at that point? So we'll look at some strategies for getting your students, again, to think about improving their skills, moving off that plateau. And then I'll wrap up with some uh, resources and uh, open discussion for your questions and your own uh, strategies. So these are some typical conversation starters that you often find in some ESL materials. And if you notice, they um, they're very adaptable to various levels. They can be used to elicit certain um, complexity of response. So some of these start out very simply. You would just have um, talking about yourself and your likes, your dislikes, your interests, um, talking about some opinions, the best qualities of a friend. Then you can get into more narrative responses. So. Um, something my friend or my husband or wife does that is strange, that will uh, elicit a narrative. Then some of these will elicit past tense narrative and even getting into more complex structure like the conditional. Okay, so these can be useful. And particularly for fluency practice, using familiar phrases and vocabulary, um, they can be useful for warm up. But some of their limits, it's often very one-sided, okay? You're getting a student to speak um, and you can ask questions, but then that's often just eliciting more sustained speaking from the student. Um, and it also relies on vocabulary and phrases that are familiar to the student. So when we think about um, improving conversational skills, okay? It's good to think about what we're working towards. And the idea that you want to become more fluent. So um, linguists and um, cognitive psychologists make a distinction between fluency and proficiency. And so fluency is where you can speak easily, um, you're not stuttering, you're not uh, falling over your words, a lot of expression, where proficiency is competence in using the language at a particular level. Okay. So the idea that somehow um, these are the same is actually belied by research on brain injury, which shows that there are a couple different types of aphasia that manifest in different kinds of difficulty speaking. And one is Broca's aphasia, where a person speaks haltingly with great effort, but they produce meaningful speech. There's another one called Werner's aphasia, where a person can speak with very little effort, very rapidly, very easily, but very little mean. Okay. So that just shows that these are distinct um, language skills. And pretty much when we're talking about ESL conversation 
and improving your speech, we tend to use them interchangeably, um, or we think about them largely as the same goal. Um, and we, we can see, you know, I can give you some real life examples, some people who are very competent native speakers, but don't necessarily have a very complex vocabulary. They would be um, considered fluent, but not necessarily proficient. Um, but for our purposes, basically, we want to be working on both of these things at once. So this is often what happens with intermediate level and uh, high intermediate level students is they reach a certain level where they are able to function in the language. They are able to do most of the things they want. They're generally intelligible to native speakers. So people don't correct them. People don't seem too confused when they speak. So they don't get that feedback from native speakers that they might have uh, limits in their skill. And so without that feedback, they can think that they're doing okay. They're largely able to function. And so improvement tends to slow. And when I say motivation declines, it doesn't mean that they are less motivated to come to class, that they are less motivated to speak. It means that they tend to hit a certain level of declining motivation to really work towards improving. Um, and I've spoken with a number of uh, tutors where they say, yes, you know, we have an advanced conversation group and they all come and they love to speak, um, but we're, we're not really progressing or making progress. Or a one on one tutor where it's more like sitting down and having a conversation with a friend. And so it becomes more about the social aspect of language learning, which um, don't get me wrong, that's great and it's important. Um, but you want to start thinking about how to get back to the mindset of improving your skills, making progress. And so that requires thought about what we mean by improvement. Right. So most of you are familiar with the best plus assessment. This is the, the test that we use um, to assess learning or listening and speaking skills. And this shows um, how the difference is measured on the best plus between intermediate and advanced levels. So what you need to do to get to that next level. And there are two main things that, that count at this level. Um, there's also a listening uh, measurement, but pretty much students at this level can understand what they're being asked. So at the intermediate level, communication, how much comprehensible language can they produce? And at the intermediate level, there's often some filling in that still needs to occur by the listener to get the meaning. At the advanced level, largely the response is fully comprehensible and easy to understand. And likewise, another measurement is the level of complexity. So for an intermediate speaker, it's beyond basic. So they have provided some additive detail and maybe some what we call emerging complexity. So a little bit of subordination with expressions like because or when. Um, and at the advanced level, there is a lot more of this type of complexity um, using a lot more subordination, more precise vocabulary, and also what we call discourse, meaning an organized, response, full of examples, illustrations, and just a higher level of complexity. So that is how the best plus measures improvement. Okay. But I think at this point, it's really important to retouch what is the student's goal? 
where do they need to speak? And that can guide what you would be working on with them. Um, do they have, are they looking to um, pursue further education? Okay, then you might want to be working on the academic word vocabulary and working on strategies for discussion in the classroom. Are they looking to just be more comfortable in social situations? And a lot of us are uncomfortable with small talk, but it is a skill that can be practiced and learned. Um, is it more work related? And then you would be focusing more on job specific vocabulary and specific situations in which they need to communicate. Um, a lot of students, once they get to this level, it's really more like, I just want to speak better English, okay? So again, you would want to push to find out more about what opportunities, where they speak, where they, they really want to improve. And otherwise you can just be working like we usually do on general discussion topics, um, thing, items of interest, material in the news, that kind of thing. But the more specific they can get, the more helpful it will be. So um, these are some things I'm going to talk about in terms of getting students off that plateau. And that will involve looking at speaking in relation to the other, uh, other language skills, the importance of feedback, the importance of practice, um, and thinking about conversation as an exchange rather than just speaking. And then uh, a look at conversation and culture, how to get to some of those uh, unspoken elements of, uh, of the exchange. So, and again, I'll say a lot of this is really, um, I'm sure nothing you don't already know. It's just often useful to kind of go back over some of the, some of the things that we are already aware of. So I'm gonna start with the question of vocabulary because speaking, a skill we use most, starts really with words, right? Um, but if you think about that, a lot of us possess several distinct vocabularies, okay? And I just, um, if, if you had to guess, which one of these do you think is the largest? What would you say? Reading, writing, or speaking? And feel free to throw in the chat or unmute. Um, but uh, which one of these do you think would be the largest vocabulary? Okay. I see a couple people have said reading. Okay. Um, someone said writing. Okay. A lot of people saying reading. One person, a couple people are saying speaking. Okay. So I'm going to ask someone who said speaking, if you could unmute and tell me why. Why do you think speaking? Um, Volunteer. I think, oh. oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's Janet Asbury. Um, I, I don't know if I really understood the question when I said speaking. So yeah, they probably do have more vocabulary for reading or writing. I'm sorry, That's all right. <laughs> see somebody else. Um, okay, so why would you say reading? I open this to anyone. Well, who's... my student in particular is, um, um, she, she has a pretty large vocabulary for an intermediate student. She doesn't always pronounce words correctly, but I think she has a large knowledge base and uh, we're working more on writing, which she's not really um, a very good writer yet. She can do good sentences, but she, she can't put a paragraph together. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's getting there, but um, so I think her reading vocabulary is good. Um, 
sometimes she reads things like she could pronounce a word, but I don't think she knows the meaning of it. So we have to go back after we read things and say, what words didn't you understand? Does mm -hmm. that make sense yeah. to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. As yeah. the assistant coordinator um, in Exton, we I do a lot of the pre-testing and we find that many of our students read far better than they speak. So that sometimes we use the CASAS test and sometimes mm -hmm. the CASAS is not a good indicator of their speaking ability, obviously, because they read well, but yet they really have a difficult time speaking. Okay. Well, and if you think about it, even for ourselves, I mean, if, if I pick up a text, like a biology textbook, I could probably read most of the words in that text. Are they words that I use in my everyday speech? No. Okay. So largely, our, mo for most people, your reading vocabulary is your largest vocabulary. And I'm talking here about native speakers um, because most of us can read a number of words that we do not use in our everyday speech. Our speaking vocabulary, we tend to rely on a basic stock of words, okay? And the thing about reading is it brings in language from outside yourself, okay? So one of the things that we want to do in practicing conversation is bring in as much um, language as possible. Okay, so what that means is, okay, learning a language involves all four skills. And of course, you learn to speak by speaking. You have to, it's, it's a muscle memory. It's like you, you can't learn to swim by reading a book. You can't learn to play piano by reading a book. You have to actually do it. Likewise with speaking, but in order to enlarge the, the range of complex grammar, vocabulary, it comes through the receptive skills, both reading and listening. You'll notice that listening was not included on that, on that prior chart, okay? So this brings me to my, my own example from, uh, from experience as a language learner. Um, as, a, as an undergraduate, I signed up for a converse, advanced conversation course. Um, I was studying French at the time. I had studied since eighth grade all through high school. And I thought this one credit, one-on-one -on -one, meeting with the professor, talking would be an easy, uh, an easy task. And what he told me was, go out and um, find something, a topic you're interested in, good pedagogy, um, read something about it, come and prepare to talk for about three to four minutes on that topic, and then we will discuss it. That will be our subject for conversation. The problem is I did not know how to read. I had come through the audio lingual method and it was all dialogues, we did not learn how to read. And especially we did not learn the technique of skimming and scanning through a lot of information to even get to something that you might be interested in reading in detail. And being too embarrassed to tell the professor that I dropped the course. And it was years before I actually learned to read the language. So the reason I bring this up is that if you are asking your student to perform a task, make sure you are teaching that task, okay? So if you are including reading as part of your, um, your subject matter for conversation practice, you also want to include instruction on reading or at least assure that your student has the reading skill. So one of the texts that we use um, at Literacy Pittsburgh for um, teaching conversation is very useful in this regard because it works with proverbs. The text is called Compelling American Conversations. And so it has a lot of very dense, rich material for conversation, 
but it does not involve a lot of extensive reading. And it's all on, um, some of them are proverbs from different cultures that are contrasted um, on topics like friendship or money or use of time. Um, and so it can, it can lessen the cognitive load of reading but still bring in outside vocabulary, um, grammar structures, and give a lot of rich topic for conversation. If you are involving uh, longer texts, like news articles or something, then you really want to be sure to um, focus on reading comprehension first, the before, during, and after that we always do teaching reading looking at the pictures, looking at the captions, looking at the title, predicting what it will be about, breaking, um, finding out what the student already knows about the topic, breaking it down, reading in short chunks, and then have the students summarize and talk about it. Um, one thing you can do after you have modeled this enough is have the student lead the class or have the student present it to you. Have them go over pre-teach the vocabulary, have them um, come up with questions to have other members of the group do. I can tell you that what students most remember is what they actually have to do themselves. And so having a student actually lead the conversation is a very powerful uh, exercise that will move them up to the next level. It will require preparation and practice, but it will, it will move them up. Something else is in your reading, encourage your student to develop a personal lexicon. Um, so words that they pick out that they are likely to use in everyday speech. So <laughs> they used to sell, you know, those little telephone books that you would keep people's names and addresses in with all the alphabet uh, tabs on them. They used to be very easy to find. I would have students um, get those and use them as an alphabet, um, alphabetized lexicon. They're harder to find now um, and more expensive, but having just having a notebook and they can organize it alphabetically or thematically um, to make it personally useful to them. And as they develop their personal lexicon, have them you know, use the word in various ways and introduce it into your conversation. Um, Roberta, there was a, a comment uh, in the chat. So Joyce, so first I added the link to the Compelling Conversations book. Oh, great. Okay. Um, but also Joyce said the problem that they found with Proverbs is that they are often culturally based. They are. That's what makes it so interesting um, that the, Compelling American Conversations does not only include American proverbs. And so you can use them to explore what kind of cultural attitudes they reveal. Um, so yeah, some, they, they require some unpacking to, uh, to talk about what they might be saying about a particular culture. Um, so in, in my view, that's what makes them so, so rich as a topic. But um, let's talk more about that during the discussion, if you've encountered issues. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, a little more directly to the, to the point of using reception to encourage uh, production is uh, listening. So listening is also bringing in vocabulary structure um, from outside yourself. So it is a way of expanding the student's um, exposure. And unlike reading, it actually provides models of real speech. So you can be listening for rhythm, for stress, for intonation. You'll be getting idiomatic expressions. Um, and you would work listening exercises very similar to reading. You would be doing a before, during, after, having the students summarize, uh, responding to what they hear. There is uh, a lot of material available. Um, a lot of our tutors have used like TEDx talks, 
for instance. Um, there you can find on YouTube um, a lot of interesting material using television. Um, sitcoms like learning English with friends, something like that. The, the nice thing about those are they're usually thematically organized and some of them are actually focused on um, particular usage of speech. So a series of clips um, showing the expression must have for must have. And not that we would necessarily have students using that expression, but recognizing. Um, and so this can be, I have a, a list of some listening resources. Um, StoryCorps from NPR. A lot of this stuff comes with transcripts. Um, okay. And the material that has transcripts, you can actually then use it to analyze the speech. Okay. Have students identify complex and compound sentences, identify examples of idiomatic expressions or subordinate clauses, have them listen and focus on the stress patterns, how it's the content words that are uh, the focus of stress and how at the same time, we de-emphasize the, the structure words. So we skip quickly over them, look at it like a piece of music almost. Um, we use a pronunciation book for advanced speakers called Clear Speech that really focuses on the music of English. Okay. And so you can, you can really um, become intentional about um, practicing complexity, okay? having your student introducing um, grammar analysis and grammar practice to build more complexity in their production. And the, the thing about you know, teaching conversation is a lot of times we focus on fluency and we just want a lot of practice on becoming more comfortable speaking. That's important. Um, but then as you listen to your student and observe, then you can actually become intentionally focused on proficiency, on increasing the complexity of their speech. So one thing that becomes uh, very important at this level, if the student is going to move off that plateau is feedback. And um, increasingly, you know, as students, advance, the, the feedback often becomes more implicit. So you, you just recast what they said. Um, so a, a beginning level example, for instance, I want learn, you would say yes, okay, you want to learn. And you're not, you're not explicitly correcting, you're just putting it out there, okay. Um, and so when you are practicing for fluency, that is one thing that you would want to do, okay? But I would strongly suggest recording your student, playing it back so that you can really hone in on what, where they need help. What are some patterns of pronunciation issues or vocabulary? And it's not like you need to play back a whole hour long um, lesson. Just, you know, pick five minutes and listen to it, see what you notice. And then you can work more explicitly on what they need based on observation. And so when you're correcting explicitly, you would just introduce, this is how we say it in, in English, or this is how Americans would say this. Okay. and then just give them the, the correct phrasing. Okay. And then of course, you always um, want to keep recycling, reviewing, uh, whatever you've been working on, bring it in in new contexts. Um, and you can use recordings also as a way for students to see their own progress. You know? So record 
a snippet of conversation or a little bit of your of your Zoom session and have them come back to it a couple months later, see what they hear, okay? And see if they can notice their own improvement. So again, this is about conversation and not really about writing so much, but I find that writing practice um, encourages production of language, and it can also be used then as topic for conversation with your student. And so um, if you think of writing simply as written conversation and not formal writing, then it, it lowers the barrier. So something that we um, in, encourage is use of a dialogue journal, which is a written exchange between uh, tutor and student, where you just pass it back and forth. And you can start with a question, okay? Um, and have them write back to you. It doesn't have to be every time you meet, it could be maybe, you know, if you meet Tuesday, Thursday, it can be, this is our Thursday thing. And you would, if you write a response to your student, you can model um, where you see error. You can, again, that implicit correction, you can model it in your response. Um, and if you do that, make sure that you read it together. Um, your your written response before you hand it off to the student and expect them to to write back to you. You can also do a personal journal, which is not a private journal. It's intended to be read, um, but a, a really good um, writing teacher is Natalie Goldberg. She was a, she's a creative writing teacher. She has a wonderful book called uh, Writing Down the Bones. This was published like in the mid eighties, I think. Um, and the interesting thing about her is she is also a practicing Zen Buddhist. So a lot of her writing um, prompts do not get you tangled up in very complex grammar. They are just observational things. Like just sit down and start writing, just write for 10 minutes without stopping. If you don't know a word, leave it blank just keep writing. You can go back and fill it in later, or you can ask your tutor. Um, she has wonderful prompts like just go for a walk and everything that you see of the color yellow, or look out your window and then write for 10 minutes about what you saw. And um, that kind of informal writing can also then encourage uh, more vocabulary building, more topics for conversation and just more free-flowing production. Okay. And of course, this is something um, that you already know. Class is not enough. Okay. The, the two hours twice a week spent with you um, is, is really, if, if they want to get off the plateau, okay, then they need to be engaging with other speakers and try to find out where else does your student speak English? What do they talk about? What do they want to talk about? If they are unable to get out and engage with other people, um, you know, do they watch English language television? Do they listen to the radio? Try to get them to engage outside of class, more time with you and bring it back. Um, to their lesson with you, okay? And so it doesn't always have to be just speaking practice every day. It can be any of the four skills. So if they just read some every day or listen to the radio every day, um, anything that will just keep them in uh, contact with English. And part of what's required after a certain level is um, once things become a little bit easy, then it's hard to remember back to how hard you had to work as at the beginning level to 
learn this language. And so try to rekindle that beginner's mind of think about how hard you worked to learn English at the beginning, okay? And try to refocus on putting that kind of beginner's effort into it. I don't wanna make this sound like intermediate and advanced speakers um, are lazy and not committed. It's just that a certain level of comfort seeks in. Um, I would see if they can find a conversation partner who will correct them. Have them, you know, uh, be very explicit with the conversation partner that they want feedback. Okay. So another challenge with, um, with conversation class is that usually it often focuses on speaking. And we ask questions of the student to get them to speak. Okay. So how do you get it to make it more of a, a real conversation that is an exchange, more like a tennis match where you actually have a volley going. And so I do have um, a, a handout of some activities that you can use. And this comes from, um, some of them are from a book uh, teaching one-on-one. -on -one. Some of them are from a former instructor at Literacy Pittsburgh who taught high intermediate level students. Um, and a lot of them are activities to encourage back and forth. So practicing follow-up questions. Um, you can have something like a, a question dice or a card that they pull and whatever question word it is, then they have to come up with a follow-up question uh, using that word. You can put someone in the hot seat and do a question and answer um, type of activity. If you're teaching one-on-one, -on -one, you can do something that's called the empty chair, where you the student chooses someone, it can be a famous person or a family member, and you have that person sitting in the empty chair, and you talk about them, you ask questions about them. You can make up a pretend person, like this is the our neighbor, you live on one side, they live on the other and start talking about that neighbor, okay? Um, you can give limited information. So say, okay, this weekend I went to the movies and make the student ask you, okay? What did you, what did you see, okay? Just give a short answer, okay? Did you like it? Who was in it? What was it about? Just forcing them to, uh, engage in exchange. Okay, and finally, I'm going to talk briefly about um, conversation and culture. Um, we used to uh, teach what we called culturally puzzling incidents. And there are now whole books of these. Um, the source for this one is Crossing Cultures in the Language Classroom. And these you can use as reading material. I have another source too. Um, sometimes uh, these are useful because they're focused on language learners. I have another source that's more focused on American business people going abroad, but still it has some, some useful cultural interactions. And so you look at this incident where something has gone wrong you know, in this case, uh, two, uh, Sarah, and Natalie, they're in a class together and they're having coffee and Sarah introduces Natalie as her good friend. And Natalie says, no, no, we're, we are acquaintances. We have coffee together. We talk about little things, but we are not friends. Okay. What happened here? Okay. This goes beyond language. You're talking about different cultural ideas. And then it has um, an analysis. So uh, it, it gives you talking points about different ideas of friendship. Okay. I have another website reference that talks about um, some that looks at some small talk faux pas where you can look at, okay, what is considered polite? 
uh, topic of discussion or polite questions or look at all these signals that this person wants to disengage from this conversation. And you actually look at them and analyze them and study them. Some of these unspoken things can be the hardest, um, the, the hardest things for English language learners to learn. Okay, so these are some of uh, the resources. Um, this is the other cultural one I, I was referring to, cross-cultural dialogues, 74 brief encounters, okay, with cultural difference. And again, it has a situation and then an analysis. And this just gives some other uh, resources for listening, for reading, um, the Natalie Goldberg reference for writing. And let's see, I will, I will stop there and I will open it up for questions or also if you have any resources or activities that have been successful for you that you would like to share with your fellow tutors, um, feel free. Good morning. Uh, I'm Pat Moran and I teach for the United Neighborhood Center. And I have an adult learner who um, you match perfectly in your observations. She speaks well, but she has that kind of difficulty. I've started using our local newspaper and having her read the letters to the editor. And then we talk about them for our session. And it's amazing the words that she comes back to me and says, I don't know what this means, what this person is trying to say for things advantageous. Yes, she looked it up, but in the context of the letter, she and I finding that her vocabulary, although still basic, is expanding ever so little. She pauses now. She questions with the actual question in her voice. So I find found that to be a very, very useful tool. I get the paper every morning. I read it. I bring it to class, highlight some things. But the one thing you gave me that I'm going to start tomorrow uh, is the journal to have her just randomly write things and see how she blends in with what she's acquiring. This was very good, by the way. I'm sorry I didn't join sooner. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and I really like that idea of letters to the editor because um, they they tend to be more natural natural language than um, than an article written by a journalist necessarily. And so I think that's that's. And wonderful. in her efforts to join into the community, that to me was a better approach than more formal structured reading, which she can has started to, to touch, but for her immediate need, your point about what do you want really guided how we approached everything. And she sees how you and I speak similarly, but quite differently. And I think that's helping her. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, do I have something in the chat? I can't see. Okay. Um, I don't think I, I submitted actually the um, the resource of conversation activities. Let me see if I can um, put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll send it to Rachel, and uh, it can be put up on the website with the with the recording. I I think I was able to find it in the email you sent me earlier. It's the word document conversation activities. Yeah. Yeah. I put, oh, okay. I, I put that in the chat as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and we have a comment from Christine um, who says they use newspaper articles in the daily item in Epic or epic times and informal writing. And we also sometimes have class discussions. Great, yeah. Um, so in using the newspaper, 
Um, I really do think that it's nice to have the student then prepare the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after you've done it in class where you're presenting the material, make, make them more responsible for coming up with questions, um, coming up with vocabulary. Students mostly remember things they have to do themselves. Um, good, what are, here's a question. What are some good ways to improve pronunciation? Um, I would say you get a lot more bang for your buck um, by focusing on stress and intonation rather than individual sounds at this point. Um, that native, uh, native speakers can fill in a lot when it comes to sound, but um, if, the, if the stress is off and this is an example that, that I use much to my chagrin, but I was asked to, um, to translate an interview from, uh, by a local organization. And there was one phrase I could not get out of the whole interview. And I went over it and over it. I had two other speakers of that language listen to it. They couldn't get it. I could tell from context, it was a, a proper name. And it was Sidi of Azilum. City of Asylum, which turned out to be City of Asylum, which turned out to be the organization that was asking me to translate the, the interview. And it was the one thing. And if she had said City of Asylum, I would have been able to fill it in. But it was the Asylum that, that threw us all off. Um, and so, yeah, someone said the Clear Speech book is great. I highly recommend it because that is really what it focuses on is putting the stress on the content words and then also de-stressing the, all the connecting words um, that we use. And then analyzing as you listen to people speaking in the TED Talks or the StoryCorps or whatever other listening materials, have them really focus in, mark accents, um, categorize words by where the stress goes. You know, is it first syllable small or middle syllable? Make, just draw attention to that aspect of speech. Thank you, Rachel. She's just put in the, the connection to the clear speech book. Okay. Well, I hope this was useful. Um, I, would, I would love to hear more about your experiences, um, teaching conversation, especially those of you working with small groups. Um, or especially people teaching online. I know that's, that adds another, another challenge. And I just put something in the chat. There's a link to fill out the survey. We would love it if you would fill out the survey. Just let us know what you thought of the presentation or also if you would like um, to join the mailing list and get um, the direct mail about this webinar series. All right, so lots of okay. thank yous to you, Roberta. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming, yeah. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming and participating um, and for being flexible with our slightly different format this time. Thank you both, take care. Okay.